Hello again, and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 65, and it is entitled Combined Circuits, Ammeters, and Voltmeters. Most electric circuits are not completely parallel, nor are they completely series. The circuit that you see to the right is a combined circuit. If I asked you, what's the current through resistor R4? Or what's the potential drop across resistor R2? Then this lesson and the techniques that are developed in it will help us to be able to answer those questions. The place to begin is to remember what it is that we know already about series circuits and parallel circuits. You'll recall that voltage is what actually drives charge around in a circuit. Sources of voltage include batteries or power supplies. Capacitors we'll see that are charged will cause voltages as well. They produce differences in electrical pressure in the circuit and the charges move in response to that. The units for volts are joules per coulomb. When we talk about current, we talk about the rate at which electrons or charge flows in a circuit, and we measure a current in terms of amperes, which are the same as a coulomb per second. Ohm's law is a relationship between current, voltage, and resistance. Current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. Electrical power is expressed in terms of three different equations, and depending on what information is available in the problem will help to dictate which one that you will use. In a series circuit, all of the resistors are connected end to end. So whatever charge flows through one resistor will also flow through the other resistors. And there's a relationship between the current that flows through the equivalent resistance that I'll call RS, and the current that flows through each of the other resistors, all of those currents are the same. Whereas the potential drop, the difference in electrical pressure across the equivalent resistance, is the sum of the individual potential drops across each of the three resistors. And then if I want to find what the equivalent resistance is, then I add up the individual resistances. For resistors that are in parallel, if I were to replace the series of the resistors that are in parallel with each other, with a single resistor, then I would take the reciprocals and add them together in order to figure out what the reciprocal of the equivalent resistor is. The current that goes through the equivalent resistor is equal to the sum of the currents that pass through the individual resistors, and the total potential drop across the equivalent resistor is the same as the potential drops across each of the individual resistors. Now, with these things in mind, we want to approach combined circuits. How am I going to do that? And the answer is that there is no single technique for dealing with them. For myself, the way that I approach these problems is in a stepwise fashion. I try to collapse the resistors into simpler and simpler circuits until I eventually end up with a single resistor that can replace the entire circuit. I try to find out what are the characteristics, the current, the voltage, the equivalent resistors of that single gigantic resistor. And after I find that, I use techniques of logic, a bit like Sherlock Holmes does to solve mysteries, in order to find out the currents and the voltages and equivalent resistances of the other simpler stepwise circuits until I finally make my way all the way back to the original circuit. That works for me. I don't know if that would work for you but I'm going to suggest that as a starting point. Let's take a look at the first example and see how that looks. The voltage of the battery is 10 volts, and R1, R2, and R3 are 2, 4, and 6 ohms, respectively. Determine A, the total current, IT, B, the voltage drop across R1, C, the current through R3, and D, the current through R4. I think the difficult part about these problems is figuring out which resistors are in what sort of combination with other resistors. And here's a way that I work. I tend to color differences in potential in my circuits using Roy G. Biv colors, starting with the battery and working towards other parts in the circuit. I make high potential parts red, low potential parts blue, and intermediate potential things with intermediate colors. In this circuit, the high potential side and any wires that are connected to them start out with the highest potential color. The low potential side and any parts of wires, conductors that are connected to them is going to get colored with the low potential color. Once I get to a resistor or some other circuit element, then I stop and I'm going to have to change colors 
because I have resistor R1 that's encountered after this high potential, then there's going to be some difference in potential across R1 that causes charge to flow it through it. Likewise, there's going to be a R2 and R3 that are encountered by the low potential side of the circuit. And in between R1 and R2 and R3 are conductors that connect those together. All of those conductors are going to have the same color. And I'm going to choose an intermediate color. I'm going to choose the color yellow to indicate those. Wherever there is a color difference in the circuit means that there is going to be a difference in potential or a voltage. What I hope that you see here is that R2 and R3 have the same color differences across them, so that R2 and R3 have the same voltage across them. And since they have the same voltage drop across them, that means that they are in parallel with each other. So I could sketch an equivalent circuit that shows R2 and R3 in parallel with each other, and I could use the parallel information for resistors to figure out what the equivalent resistor is. Let's do that in what I'll call step one of this process of unraveling this circuit. Let me figure out what R23 is using the parallel resistor information. The values of R2 and R3 are 4 and 6 ohms respectively. I get a common denominator of 12 and once I've solved for 1 over R23 then I take the reciprocals in order to find what R23 is. R23 is 2.4 ohms. Now let's go back and look at our coloring again. Starting with the battery, I start with the high potential on the high potential side, low potential color on the low potential side, and some intermediate potential color in between. Again, I'm going to use yellow. In this circuit now, I have two resistors that I see that are in series with each other. Resistor R1 and resistor R23 are in series. So I could combine those two into a single resistor that's a series resistor. I'm going to call this my step 3 circuit. If I go back with my color scheme, I'll color each side of the battery with the high and the low potential colors. And you'll see now that because the equivalent resistor R123 has the same difference in colors as the battery does, then the potential drop across R123 is going to be the same as the potential drop across the battery, the 10 volts. I can figure out what resistor R123 is because I know what the resistance values of R1 and R23 are. I'll use the series resistor formula to figure that out. Now I'm going to put in the numbers, and now I found that the equivalent resistor has a resistance of 4.4 ohms. Through that 4.4 ohms flows all of the current. Across that 4.4 ohms falls 10 volts. Let me figure out what the current is through R123 using Ohm's law. Since the potential drop across the resistor is the same as the potential drop across the battery, then I'm going to put the EMF of the battery in for the voltage. Let's solve that equation for the current. I find that the total current through the equivalent resistor is 2.27 repeating amperes. I can use that information now and work backwards from step 2 to step 1. And what I find is that the amount of current that passes through R1 and the amount of current that passes through R23 are each going to be 2.27 amperes because these two resistors are in series with each other. Since I know what the current is through each of the resistors, then I could figure out what the potential drops are across each of the resistors. Let's figure that out. For the first resistor, I can say that I1 is V1 over R1. Now let's solve that equation for V1 and let's substitute the numbers. I find that the potential drop across the first resistor is 4.54 volts. Now let's do it for the equivalent resistance R23. Again, we start with Ohm's law and solve it for the voltage and now put in the numbers. I find that the voltage drop across V23 is 5.45 volts. Okay, well, now let's go back up and see that because R2 and R3 are in parallel with each other, whatever potential drop was across R23 is the same as the potential drop across R2 and across R3. Let me write that down. Since I now know what the potential drop is across each of those resistors, then I can solve for the current through those resistors. We begin with Ohm's law and now put in the numbers. The current through resistor 2 is 1.36 amperes, repeating. The third resistor, starting with Ohm's law and now putting in the numbers, I get just over 9 tenths of an ampere flowing through R3. 
So now I have figured out everything that I can about this circuit in terms of the voltage drops and the currents through each of these resistors. Let's go back and see if I've answered all the questions. What is the total current, IT? Well, I figured that out when I got down to step two down there at the bottom. IT was 2.27 amperes. The voltage drop across R1 was 4.54 amperes. And now the current through R3 was 0.91 amperes and the current through R2 was 1.36 amperes. For me, solving these circuits in a stepwise fashion until I get a single resistor seems to work. And that's what I would suggest that you do when you solve these problems. Now let's talk about ammeters and voltmeters. Just about any kind of electrical gauge is a voltmeter or an ammeter. If you want to know how much fuel you have in your car and you look at the fuel gauge, that is a modified meter of some sort. The temperature gauge on your automobile or some other electronic temperature gauge, that is a modified meter of some sort. If you look at some sort of digital gauge, say for controlling something on a machine, generally those readouts are given in some sort of meter. There are two basic kinds. One is a voltmeter, the other is an ammeter, and there are three of them pictured here. On the left is an analog AC voltmeter. You can tell that it's AC because it has this little squiggly line right there. That squiggly line tells you that it's a sine curve, and analog means that there is an indicator which varies continuously along some scale, and the scale is graduated in terms of volts in this particular situation. In the middle, you have an analog DC ammeter, and you can tell it's an ammeter, and you can tell that it's DC because it tells you that on the label. Over on the right, you have what's called a digital multimeter, which means that it is able to do a variety of jobs depending on what dial setting you have and how you plug in the cords along the bottom. This can be DC voltmeter or an AC voltmeter. It can be a DC ammeter or an AC ammeter, or it's even able to be an ohm meter. The maximum reading on the scale is the number that you dial the dial to. If you try to read a value that is larger than that number, then you would get some error message on the digital meter. The key to dealing with meters is to recognize that voltmeters measure differences in potential. They are connected in parallel across circuit elements, whereas ammeters measure current that flows through and that is connected in series. Let's write that down. Let's take this next example. In the circuit below, show how a voltmeter could be placed to measure the voltage drop across R2 and how an ammeter can be placed to measure the current flowing through R3. I want to start again with my coloring scheme. Remember Roy G. Biv? We're trying to figure out the difference in potential across R2. So somehow I have got to connect the purple leg of the circuit with the yellow leg of the circuit. And it does not matter where I make those connections within the circuit as long as I have one side of the voltmeter connected to the purple side and another connected to the yellow side. So here is one possible way of connecting the voltmeter. We indicate a voltmeter with a circle that has a V on the inside to measure voltage. But that's not the only way I could connect it. There are several other combinations. Here's one. I could go from one point in the circuit that's on the yellow leg and the other point on the purple leg. That's another possible combination. Yet another would be to come across R3. Now you might say, well, I'm measuring the voltage drop across R3. And I would say, yes, you are. But because R3 and R2 have the same voltage drop, because they have the same colors, differences across them, then any of those three combinations would measure the potential drop across R2 and it would measure the potential drop across R3. Now let's go to the ammeter. In the ammeter, I have to connect it in series with R3. One way to do it would be to put my ammeter inside the leg that's between R2 and R3. Another would be to put the ammeter down below. And as long as R3 is the only thing that's upstream or just downstream 
from the resistor, then that ammeter will read what's going through R3, but not what's going through R2. So there's a set of possible answers to that question. Practice is what makes perfect on these. For now, that's it.